Good evening, everyone. It's Necro Thursday, which means that it's time for the Necromaniacs Horror Podcast. I hope everyone's having a great week. And I'm here with Jeff. How's it going, Jeff? It's going okay, man. It's been quite a week. How about you? It's also been quite a week for me, uh, as we were talking about uh, prior to the start of this episode. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you were some, saying. some couple good things, a couple really bad things. And, uh, you know, we'll leave it at that. But um, right now, I'm doing okay. Yeah, well. You know. Good. Glad to hear it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, first, I get the shout outs, man. All of our friends out there. Of course, we're talking about the Horsemen of the Podcasting Apocalypse. On Monday, We've got Brandon Legion bringing us Horror Wolf 666, and he interviews filmmakers, actors, sometimes one of the other horsemen, and anyone Mm -hmm. else involved in the horror field, movies. He's had a couple of writers on there, that sort of stuff. Tuesday comes Into the Necrosphere with Jackie Smith, and that is the premier extreme music podcast in the world. That is like the number one, in my opinion, and... um. If I want to listen to anything about black metal, death metal, extreme music, I go to Jackie because he covers the whole thing. He's got it covered. Wednesday is Everything Went Black, which is uh, what got me into podcasting. I started so doing this for a long time. And uh, mm-hmm. it's uh, you know kind of where I worked out everything, uh, figured out how I wanted to exist, you know, how I wanted the podcast to exist, and kind of went from there. And that was a, kind of like a training ground for me. Thursday is Necro Thursday, which is today. Friday is Break the Apocalypse, which um, is Mike's brother John's show. And Sunday on the Lord's Day is Soul Knox, brought to you by Carl Hikara. And that's it, man. We got you covered every six, six out of the seven days of the week. We got you covered. That is not bad. Yeah. And uh, also, no no phone calls this week, but we have a, an, a live voicemail that if you want to call in and leave a message. We had like three voicemails last week, and we don't have anything this week. But uh, mm. you call in, we listen. Um, we're going to start playing some of these things. I'm just trying to figure out where in the show to drop the, uh, the actual audio. But if you don't right. want to be put on the show, please say so. But uh, yeah. So the number is 908-913- 0782 908-913-0782 and that's the necromaniacs horror hotline for lack of a better term right and that is your personal phone number right mike oh yeah yeah if you want to just give me a shout and you know talk about stuff you i'll i'll, I'll that's my number you know, so, yeah. yeah just two three four in the morning you know it's all good <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, give, I'll, I'll also give my address out too in case anyone wants to visit oh, me out here. <laughs> perfect. Yeah, because no weirdos listen to horror podcasts. That's this is not a thing. I don't think it'd lead to any problems if I gave my number and address to anyone. So, so yeah, N- not at all. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, have you been checking out anything this week? I have actually. I had. A, oh, okay. I saw a movie that I've been looking forward to seeing for a really long time. And I saw it in the movie theater uh, at the Angelica in New York City. I saw Ennis Maine, that uh, film that has got this very interesting approach to filmmaking. And uh, not a lot of dialogue, a lot of imagery. And, you know, that seems Mm. to be like a trend, I guess, if you want to call it these days, with um, experimental filmmaking. We have Skinner Marink, we have The Outwaters, you know, which you and I both pretty much destroyed the outwaters and uh <laughs> i liked yeah. it more than you but yeah yeah I, you know I'm not amazing or anything yeah you know, from a while ago there was Seder, which um in some ways i look at as one of the uh you know kind of at the beginning of this uh this era of films like that and uh and ennis main fits right in there um i would call it a like a british folk horror uh you know that that's like a catch-all i guess but it does take place in a small island allegedly off the coast of Cornwall, you know, in Cornwall, okay. you know, that's one of those uh, places. There's a lot of history there. A lot of, you know, pagan, um, that's where the, the many are those standing stones. So that has a lot to do with uh, what the film is about. So standing stones and uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. You know, it's definitely check it out. I was able to see it in the movies. I'm sure it'll be streaming at some point relatively soon. And I can't say enough good things about it. 
I would say this is pro- or guess this is a small release, you know, a couple theaters here and there kind of thing. Yeah, I had a hard time. Well, besides from going into the city to the Angelica, I couldn't find it anywhere in Jersey or Philly. And uh, mm. so I just, you know, picked a Sunday. It was actually Easter Sunday that I went in to check oh, it out. Oh, perfect. Yeah, so. It's probably empty too then. Yeah, there was only two other people there. Um, and I frankly, I, I can't imagine. It, it's not, you know, it's not like going to see like uh, Black Adam or something like that where there'd be like teenagers there and stuff. It was, you know, you know more, yeah, more of totally. a focused audience, I guess, you know. Yeah, no, yeah, of course. That's one thing I, I kind of miss about living in LA is 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 things like that. Because in Austin, you don't really get those kind of movies. Like uh, I wanted to see uh, Bill is Afraid this weekend because I saw that it came out, but then I realized, oh, it came out in New York and LA, not here. And uh, you know, you you, you kind of forget. Like I'm like, oh shit, I don't live. <laughs> yeah, I don't live there anymore. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised that uh, Austin didn't get that, you know, because I, I, in my mind, Austin is like kind of like a very cultural city. Mm. It is. I mean, it, it's playing next week, uh, but like, yeah, you know, you just don't get things early like uh, New York and L.A. does. Or if we do, I, I don't know about it. Right on. I like that. I also caught uh, this this uh, docuseries on Showtime called Catching Lightning, which is about oh. the uh, MMA fighter Lightning Lee Murray, who... Um, was like this up and coming guy. He was in the UFC for for a period, and uh, and then he was involved in like one of the biggest like bank robberies in uh, in Britain's British <laughs> recent history, and he's like currently in jail right now. <laughs> oh shit! You know, I think they were talking about him on a podcast or something fairly recently. Maybe someone else saw this, but yeah, that that, that sounds familiar. Is it, is it a good doc? Oh yeah, it's great. It's it's a wild story, man. And uh, you know they have um, interview footage with a lot of you know famous fighters like Anderson Silva, Chuck Liddell, uh, you know a bunch bunch of very you know notable people are are in there. And it's there's some audio f- interviews with him. There's no video. He's in you know of him current video of him being interviewed because he's incarcerated right now. And it's just a wild story, man. It's like uh, it's almost like a Guy Ritchie movie or something, you know. I was going to say, it kind of sounds like the plot of a Guy Ritchie movie. Yeah. He'll probably make that movie eventually. Yeah, I, I would, wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, me neither. All right. Um, what about you? I checked out a few things, Mike. Um, I also went to the movie theater this week uh, to the Alamo Draft House for the first time in Austin. Oh, yeah. I, I made it to the Draft House, the, the, the best theater chain in the world, I'd say. Uh, and I went and saw John Vic Four. Oh, okay. Yeah, I want to see that too. Yeah, those movies are fun. Um, I thought they'd progressively gotten better. More The more outlandish they get, the more fun they are. Right. And Three was a lot of fun. That was my favorite of the bunch. Four, I liked it. But I probably liked it the least out of all four of them. Okay. I mean, I'm still going to see it no matter what. But yeah. Yeah, oh, you should. It's fun. Yeah. But it, it's very long, and I started to, to notice the sort of video game nature of the whole thing, where you just kind of have these like ultra long battle scenes that are all kind of the same after a while. They're just done in different locations, and uh, this was the first one that kind of dragged for me. Uh, I thought it was shot incredibly. It looks great, and you know the fighting and action is great. But by the time you're on you know, you see Keanu Reeves, like, you know, roll someone and shoot him in the head after, like, the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth time. Like, he gets a little, you know, like, okay, I've seen this. Yeah. And then John Wick 3, you had, like, a, a knife fight, you know, him fucking killing people with horses. And then you have, like, a, a fist fight. And then you have gunplay. Like, it was just more variety to the action. And this one felt a little bit um, repetitive to me. And it went on for close to three hours. Wow. Okay. Uh, but still, good time, you know. If you like those movies, you're gonna like this one. Um, and the Draft House. If there's a Draft House in your city, I recommend going. It's such a great theater. Always have a good time. Uh, the food is actually pretty good for movie theater food. Uh, is it, I don't know if you've ever eaten at an AMC or anything like that, but no. it's pretty disgusting. Yeah, I, I yeah, got I bad. got coffee at the AMC, the one by me. Oh, okay. Yeah. How was the coffee? Yeah, it's all right. 
Okay. No, I don't. I don't. I don't drink coffee. But I, and if you're so inclined, you can um, drink alcohol there. They have beer and wine. I think they might have drinks. I don't. Oh, I don't, now, I don't now drink we're talking, anymore, man. So. Now, we're, now we're talking. Yeah. Fucking getting wasted and watching a movie. That'd be great. Yeah, exactly. Then you get wasted and hungry. You can order, you know, a pizza or something. Yeah, I wonder if they had. Uh, if they, I'm, I'm surprised that there isn't like fights and stuff like that at these places you know yeah there probably are <laughs> i just haven't you know like if i go to the movies at like i think i saw this at 10 50 in the morning i try to go as early as possible to beat up the uh, beat up the crowd yeah that's awesome man. i want to um, see it i mean the, the, uh, what it looks like in the fourth film is um i the, the trailer looks cool because there, there's like this kind of samurai thing where they're like you know talking about dying and you know death and all that i'm like yeah this is like very cool yeah, it is. It, it's you know, it's kind of light on plot, heavy on action. Just you know, you you know what you're getting when you go to see a movie called John Wick Four. You know, it's a fourth movie. Like they're not reinventing the wheel. It's a lot of fun. Just a, a little long and repetitive for me. Um, I will actually watch something like I think I don't know if we were talking about this on air last week or if we talked about it off air. But you were telling me about a Netflix film based on Adam Neville's book, and I watched that. No one gets out alive. Yes, we were talking about that. Okay. Uh, oh dear God, uh, I hated it. <laughs> yeah, the movie's terrible. The book's awesome. The oh, movie's, movie's not. Okay, right. all right. Because I, I was watching it, I was like, I can't remember if if Mike told me that the movie was good because uh, man, it was such dog shit, dude. Like, I don't know what it is about Netflix movies or like newer horror movies in general. And if anyone else can explain this to me, p- please let me know. They have this look to them. I call it that Netflix sheen. Yeah. Where like the, that weird color correction that's like all over these movies, uh, right away that drove me crazy. I mean, it's supposed to take place in this dump in Cleveland, and it looks like a movie set. It doesn't look like a like rundown house. Um, just nothing about it worked. It was just generic as a horror movie can be, like like a horror movie for people who uh, saw The Conjuring and want to watch something else that's scary. You know what I mean? Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, the book is doesn't even take place in Cleveland. It takes place in um, in uh, Birmingham. So um, yeah, that's what you were saying. That's why I thought maybe I was watching the wrong thing. No, no. Like, oh, I thought... Now they Americanized it. Uh, you know, they they swapped swapped around a bunch of stuff. There is a the, the lead the main character is a woman, which is cool. You know, and and uh, right they didn't change that at least. And um, but it, just the things about the 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 novel that work really have to it, it really has to be in england if you know what i mean it's like a sure very, very brit vibe to the to the book and there's like i think that if you moved it somewhere else it just doesn't have the same feel to it you know i mean just and adam neville's great at writing british stuff you know like the guy's right he has all the different stereotypes of british people down like all the, the speech patterns are all perfect and you know everything so it's cool yeah and to move it from england to cleveland um, I thought that was a little bit of an odd choice. Like it, it really could have been anywhere. I, I don't know if this was filmed in Cleveland, maybe some exteriors, but most of it looked like a, a set Yeah. to me. Like, a, I don't know, just weird choices all around. And looking it up, this movie actually kind of got good reviews. I, I noticed that as well. And I don't know why, but it just, people seem to like it. And, um, and even if I hadn't, well, I mean, I just, I read the book now, actually, but the um, it it wasn't. They keep they keep doing this to Adam, man. It's like the um, the, the ritual was good as a just a standalone movie, I thought. But his book, right, yeah. his book was like completely not completely different, but there was like a whole second half of that book that was removed from the movie, and I'm like, I'm like, I hope you got paid really well for that, man, because they kind of like butchered your your story a little bit, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I never read the ritual, but I, I did see it. I thought it was okay. Um, a little flat. We talked about this. Right. Um, could have been better for sure, but you know, not bad. And this was just, uh, I don't know, man. It just went in one ear and out the other. I, 15 minutes into it, I was like, I think I'm going to hate this. 20 minutes into it, I was sure I did. Um, but you know, whatever. Y- you can't win them all. Definitely not. <laughs> I know that no. for sure. You can't win them all. And this is a little outside of horror. And I don't know if I've mentioned it on this podcast, but I've been reading a book called Sellout. Okay. By 
Dan Ozzy, O-Z-Z-I, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, and it is about the uh, the uh, all all the indie bands getting signed to majors in 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 the nineties and early two thousands. It's sort of about that. Interesting. And yeah, you know, um, this is, well, while our bands were never on major labels, but you know, we've we brushed shoulders with people who have uh, signed, or you know, there was some interest. Or hey, it's a world that's sort of close to my heart. And uh, it's a subject matter that interests me. They interview bands like Jawbreaker, uh, Green Day. Um, Jawbreaker, of course, very near and dear to my heart. Uh, you know, bands like that, you know, uh, at the drive-in, the distillers. You know, a lot of bands I don't even really know who they are. But it's always interesting to read about bands in that time, that era of music, and when – everyone was looking for the next Nirvana and then everyone was looking for the next green day and how 99% of those bands just outright failed. Yeah. Yeah. For the most part, it's like a weird experiment, you know? And, uh, even yeah. like, like Jawbox too. Remember them? They got signed to a major label, you know? Yeah, and they did. So, dude. Sh yeah. Shouldn't think was on a major label, which makes almost no sense in some ways, you know? And none. None. Yeah. It's so weird. I mean, the Melvins were on Atlantic Records. I, they, everyone just got signed in the 90s. And then, uh, you know, our, my friends, Caven, was signed to a major and around in, in the early 2000s. And that uh, kind of seemed to be, like, as far as I remember, like, the end of the, the signing boom. Like, and I'm not saying it was Caven's fault, but it just seemed like around then, like, it all kind of ground to a halt, you know? Yeah, it's it's a it was a weird time. It definitely... Now that there's been all these years past, it, a book is definitely in order. You know, I think that'd be an interesting read. Yeah, and it's probably a book like every few years you can expand on. You know, like there's just so many bands out there with the with 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 stories, and you know, even bands that did okay, like or, or like you know, Quicksand got signed to a major, and I think that record for an indie, uh, if it was on an indie, would have been considered a very well, a high selling record, but for a major. You know, if you sell like 50, 60,000 copies, I don't know how many copies it sold. I'm guessing around there back then. Um, but that's not, that's nothing for a major label. If you don't go gold or whatever, I think it's back then it was seen as a, a flop. Which is a crazy, like, idea, you know? And I feel like that might not have been the case, like, in, in the 70s, really, you know? I feel like that was, that's like a more modern take on major label activity. Because, like, if you think about, you know, the 70s, there'd be bands like Thin Lizzy who put out, like, Apparently they, I mean they, obviously they're they're a legendary band, but they weren't like uh, yeah. as big as like Zeppelin or something like that. Yet they had a career, you know, and that's yeah, just seemed like that went out the window. Maybe in the eighties or nineties, you know. Probably L look at the bands that were huge. Like look at a band like Pink Floyd that would have twenty minute long songs, and they were selling millions of records. Uh, and and now. Uh, like you know, like I, not now, but like say during the signing boom, they tried to take bands like that and shave off those kind of edges and make them presentable. And it, it's just crazy. The seventies were more about artistic freedom and and all that, way more so than than the nineties were. Yeah, it's it's you know it's just a different world, man. You know, in these days, like that that whole industry is like blown to pieces right now. Anyhow, you know. Yeah, I don't even know what's keeping these major labels afloat. I don't, you know, I know it's pop acts, but like no one buys music anymore, really. I have to say it's probably like advertising and like product placement and things like that, you know, putting putting songs into movies, like, you know, that sort of thing, I believe. Yeah, that's also, I mean, mu like the music and, and film is not like the king of entertainment like it was. Back then, I think uh, YouTube and TikTok and things like that, that's where people's younger people's interest seem to lie. And people don't want to be actors and musicians anymore. They want to be YouTubers and TikTokers and all this shit. I sound like a fucking old man right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true, though, man. I, I get it. You know, it's like uh, and, and it's funny you mentioned that because um, a few weeks ago I saw Vinny Paz and uh, mm. like and uh, he would they would only do like they wouldn't even do the entire song like in their set. So they, they're gearing up their live performance to like, they would just play like, like sections of songs, like a verse and a chorus and then go to something else. And wow. uh, that's like a, a hip hop thing too. Yeah. 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 
And it's like that <clears throat> it's it feels like it's tailoring itself to that kind of TikTok world, you know, where they just everyone wants this like 30 seconds of something and that's it, you know. Yeah. Weird. Yeah, right? that's uh, no, no, it's very weird. I remember seeing live footage of I think it was Eminem. This was probably, I don't know, 10 years or so ago of him performing live. And yeah, it would be a verse from a song to a verse from another song to the chorus of another song. It was like a, he just did like a, like a 45 minute, like I didn't watch the whole thing, uh, but it was like a medley of, of like everything. Didn't do like a, a whole song that I saw. And I thought, God, that's really fucking bizarre. But I was told like, Oh yeah. Like for huge, huge, like hip hop acts. Like I guess they do shit like that or yeah. pop stars. Yeah. It's weird. I, I, well, that, that same Vinnie Paz show this um this dude, uh, Apple, uh, Crime Apple, opened. Uh, he was there was a bunch of different acts on the on the, the bill, but he was direct support, and uh, he would do the entire song though, and that, it was like this super slow, like grimy, like you know, hip hop, like real, you know, real drug dealer shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, real, real drug dealer type shit. And it was cool. It was awesome. <laughs> but he would do he would do like almost like it felt like an extended jam of the songs. You know, it's kind of cool. Yeah, I, I appreciate stuff like that too. Like I, I like like you know when we toured with Tool, they would like rework their old songs, and add new shit into it. Yeah, I, I I appreciate stuff like that. Yeah, you know, uh, but like playing a, a, I can't imagine going to see a band like that and they just play like the chorus to <laughs> yeah. their big hit. You know, I, I I would I'd be pretty disappointed, I guess. Yeah, me too, man. So anyway, yeah, anyone fucking, who's left us. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, if you guys are still yeah, listening, sorry. we're gonna we're gonna talk about uh, about a movie this week. Uh, <laughs> what are we, what are we talking about? <laughs> oh uh, yeah yeah that's right. Um, in, the Infinity yes. Pool. Yes. <clears throat> brand new film. Well, not brand new, but it came out January twenty seventh, twenty twenty three in Canada. And um, actually, the release date is at Sundance. It was only a few days before that, January twenty second at Sundance, and then right away it went to a brief theatrical run movie is 118 minutes long you know that's the trend longer you know yeah written and directed by brandon cronenberg who is a probably a necromaniac's uh f favorite i would think you know we, we all like his, his movies we dig his uh father's films as well absolutely and one of the details about the production is um that i i, I picked up on is there's a guy named kareem hussein who did the cinematography for this film and i remember finding out about him like maybe 15 years ago um there was an extra on a jim van beber uh collection of films that talked about fantasia festival in canada and kareem hussein was one of the guys on there you know jim van beber was part of that and uh and he had a film called subconscious cruelty which hmm. was a short um the thing I, it looked great. It was a, I wouldn't say I don't dislike it, but it wasn't like, it didn't really kill me. You know what I mean? I thought it was cool, right, but sure. it wasn't like you know as engaging as some other stuff. But apparently he, um, he pivoted away from writing and directing and just went into cinematography. So he's he worked on Possessor on uh, Cronenberg's last film. Okay. And yeah. So he's uh, you know he he kind of like fine-tuned his career a little bit and figured, you know what, maybe I'm not such a great script writer or, you know, directing is not my bag, but I think cinematography is really his, his trip because as, we'll, as we'll, we'll talk about it later, but that I think he's a name to be aware of. If you see him involved with a movie, you're going you're gonna to expect that it's going to look really cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe he, he and Brandon Cronenberg has found his like, uh, you know, collaborator in that sense, because I know his dad has worked with the same DPs. I think he's only worked with two DPs his whole career. And it's been the same guy since uh, Dead Ringer. So his name I, escapes me now. But yeah, that's cool. But, I love uh, when shit like that happens. And they have like a team, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Excellent cast in this film. <clears throat> We have um, Alexander Skarsgård as James Foster, Mia Goth as Gabby Bauer, Cleopatra Coleman as M. Foster, that's Skarsgård's uh, wife, Jaleel Lesper 
as Al- Albin Bauer. And I say that mm-hmm. that's kind of the core of the film. There's some other ancil- yeah. ancillary characters, and I, I'm not going to bore everyone with who they are, but you'll, um, you know, there, there's some other people involved in the film. But that's that's kind of the the epicenter of the film is those four people, their interaction. Yeah. Um, before we get started, uh, just about Brandon Cronenberg in general, I feel like now this being his third film. When Possessor and his first couple of films came out, I think there was an expectation just because of who his father was. And now I think there's just an expectation because it's a new film from Brandon Cronenberg. Yeah. I think early on, it, with Possessor, I think he really found his voice on that movie where Antiviral was, I think, really the apple falling too close to the tree. Like it really could have been a David Cronenberg film from the 70s. Whereas Possessor, he really came into his own as a uh, visualist and and thematically. Again, I don't think the apple falls too far from the tree. I think there are similarities between him and his dad, but his own voice has emerged with Possessor and seems to carry on into this film. I probably should have looked this up beforehand, but I want to see if if Kareem Hussein was involved with Antiviral as well. Mm. Um, uh, I, yeah, you know, uh, now that you mentioned, I think visually it was a little bit, it didn't strike me the same as Possessor and, and this, so maybe not, but I, again, I'm talking on my ass. I have no idea. Yeah. According to uh, my brief, uh, research here, um, he was not the cinematographer on that, um, on this film. Okay. Well, there you go. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I was looking forward to this as not David Cronenberg's son, but as the director of Possessor's new film. So, yeah, this came heavily anticipated by oh, me. Oh, I'm stand corrected. Kareem Hussein was involved in, in the cinematography. Okay, so yeah, there you go. So he's been, he worked with Cronenberg on all three of his films. Okay. Okay, so, you know, yeah. both young, both developing at, at, at that point. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Uh, so this film... Did you see this in the um, in the theater, or or did you rent it or view it somewhere else? I I, I rented it. I did not see it uh, in the theater, unfortunately. Uh, you did, right? Yes, yes. This is one of my excursions into the uh, late night AMC at Menlo Park uh, Mall. So yeah, it was me and like th- maybe five other people saw this. It was and you know, but it was totally enjoyable. I like watching movies. I could see this playing at like midnight to like an empty theater or like a theater with like, you know, there's like a drunk guy in the corner. There's another guy with an overcoat few rows behind you. Do you you imagine like, does that, you think that ever happens like in a, in a multiplex cinema where like they just play the film and there's no one there? Ah, I don't, you know, I, I have gone to the movies and I've been the only one there. And that I, that's all I could think about. Like, oh man, someone's pissed because I showed up. You know, they thought they had like a, you know, two hours to fuck around, but now they got to fucking, you know, play this because of me. That's, that's a, but, that's, uh, yeah, that I idea is like really creepy, isn't it? It's very creepy. Yeah. It's, and I'm huh. thinking about that. Cause like when I, when I saw Skinamarink, imagine like a empty theater with Skinamarink playing. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, it's <gets Yeah>. fucked <laughs> up, right? Yeah, it's so creepy. Yeah, like like on the episode, uh, I was talking about how I, when I was in the theater, there was only like a guy and his girlfriend, like these normal people, and then some other dude who fell asleep. And then like maybe 20 minutes into the movie, the couple left, and it was just me and the, <laughs> the sleeping guy. And yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that. And that was pretty creepy too, so yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is, um, I wouldn't say it's a, a departure for Brandon Cronenberg, but it, it's it's definitely a little bit different uh, f- for him from his last one. But I do uh, note like uh, he's developing themes and he's sort of, you know, a little bit, again, like his father. He makes movies that don't quite take place in the real world. They're uh, unspecific time uh, in, in, in uh, you know, this takes place in a, I would assume a made-up city. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. I think it was filmed in Greece or, or, or somewhere in, uh, over there. Uh, but it, it's not quite reality. You know, it, it's it's people and settings, but something is just very off of, about it. And 
I noticed it's the same thing in Possessor and in Antiviral. So that seems to be like a, a thing he's working on, much like, you know, when David Cronenberg made something like Existence or e even a history of violence. Like it kind of it seems somewhat like the real world, but it's but uh, it also doesn't. Uh, these films have a very similar feeling. I would agree with that, um, you know, because in Possessor, it's like, a, you know, in the it's sort of like in the near future. You know, that's I remember reading stuff about that, and it's in in some other reality. You know, and and this this uh, country that they're in is a fictional, fictitious, fictitious country. Lee Lee Tolka, Lee Tolka, I think that's what it's called. Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah, something like something like that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so Skarsgård as Foster and his wife Cleopatra Coleman is this? That's a killer name, man, isn't it? That's a great name. I love that. Name. Yeah. So uh, she plays his wife M. Okay, and uh, they're they're on vacation, and um, she's rich. Her family has money, and uh, Foster yeah. is, uh, I would say, a struggling novelist. Right. He wrote. Right. He's written one book that no one seems to have liked, or at least <laughs> that that's hinted at. Yeah. Uh, and they have uh, some kind of. Um, you can tell there's strife between the two of them. Um, because, and, and I'm going to like, you know, I'm going to get into some of that too. Just like in the cultural world, the standard society, you know, the man is supposed to be the, uh, the breadwinner, you know, the provider. And in this case, she's the provider, you know, and, and, uh, I imagine that plays with his sense of masculinity as, to, as well, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, did, did they say she worked or not? I didn't really. I didn't get the sense that either of them really worked. They just had family money. Yeah. Or she does. And and furthermore, her father was is the publisher of his book, too. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, you know, she comes from like a, um, a rich publishing family. And, um, you know, he it, there's the they don't say this, but there's like that you, you sense there's that there's some strife. And that's wise because she, you know. She's providing. He hasn't written a book in a while. The one book that he wrote, no one seemed to care about. And there was like, you know, actually bad reviews, things like that. Yeah, yeah, it, it, exactly. The way, like, it, I don't remember explicitly saying, yeah, they have problems, but it seems to be hinted at from the very beginning. You know, the movie opens with a black screen and they're having this mundane conversation and it kind of transitions into this upside down camera work and this uh, really creepy music. Uh, oh, by the way, the music by Tim Hecker, uh, an old touring touring mate of of ours. I don't know if you you did that tour with us and Tim Tim Hecker. Who is who is he? Tim Hecker is a Canadian guy. Yeah, like a laptop dude, you know, solo artist. Yeah, I wasn't on that tour with you guys, but yeah, okay, cool. I I, I the music yeah. is amazing. I'm I'm gonna for sure get this the score for this film, no doubt. Yeah, Tim. Tim's a great guy, uh, really, really talented. Uh, I, I was very excited to see his name in in, in the credits. It's like fucking a man. Do Good I for know, him. Do I know Tim? You might. I don't know. Like I, I remember playing Boston with him, and I think it was the Yezu tour. I think yeah, and and then then we did Europe with with, with Tim and Yezu as well. All right, yeah, we weren't we weren't on the Yezu tour, so that oh, so I, I maybe I met him backstage or something like that because the name is sticking yeah, out of yeah. my head. So all right, sorry for the digression there, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, we can't stop, stop talking about music today. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, so uh, I think he sets the tone that something is wrong. Um, was there even like a reason for I I I, I kind of got the feeling they were on vacation to you know, maybe like find a spark in their relationship again. Cause I know he mentions at some point, like I'm looking for inspiration, you know, for my next novel, which, you know, please. <laughs> um, yeah. I think that's really what it, I mean. And once again, they don't out and out say it, but the sense that you get is that they're going on vacation to, you know, another country to, you know, refresh things between the two of them. And, you know, and, and maybe personally, he was like, yeah, I'm trying to get some inspiration for my next one, which he has done zero work on. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. And like, I think typical of like maybe like out of touch rich people, I think going to a, a resort is something like safe and, and boring like that will be like inspirational. But it's the things that seem to happen outside of this resort that really 
kind of gives gives James at least his his awakening. Like the resort is, you get the sense that this this city or whatever they're in is like really really dangerous, and they're like gated off from all of that in this sort of alternate paradise that. I mean, I don't know about you, but the, the fucking place they were in really gave, gave, gave off very creepy vibes. Yeah, the architecture had that had a um, like an influence on the way you saw things. I think you know, and um, actually, the architecture kind of plays into this a little bit. You know, I mean, the, even the title, the Infinity Pool, is like an architectural feature. Right. Yeah. And, and all the the employees wear those masks. Also, did you notice that every all the natives had like these weird birthmarks too? Yes, the dots under their eyes, yeah. the little like markings. Yeah, uh, I was uh, kind of waiting for to, to that for that to be, maybe be explained or even mentioned, but um, never gets it's addressed. Not. There's a, <laughs> yeah, you know what though? A lot of like things you think this movie is about don't really get addressed. Like, it, like I really thought it was going to be about is this the real James or not? But that is not even like a thought in this movie, really. Some people have said that, but there's things that lead me to believe. We'll talk about it later on the film. Yeah, that it's not about that. It's it's about oh, definitely not about no. that. It's about like like other other kind of cultural or personal things, you know. Right. Yeah, and that's what I really wanted to get into it uh, with you about because I, I I was like, is this movie supposed to be taken at face value or is this somewhat metaphorical? Or because if it is, maybe a little bit was lost on me. But anyway. So, um, basically, okay, so they're on a vacation together. They meet, uh, you see uh, a woman kind of catches James's eye. And uh, that woman is uh, Mia Goth, who is having quite a moment in, 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 in cinema in the last year or so. Oh, yeah, yeah. She, she's, uh, you know trouble's coming when you see her in this movie, you know? And, yeah, yeah, and... She's telling him all the right things. You know, I read your book. I love it. <laughs> um, you know, just basically playing on his uh, his his ego, you know, like if this yeah. guy's predictable. You know, you stroke his fucking ego, he's going to be eating out of your hand. And, you know, I guess that's something that's something that anyone can relate to. Yes. Uh, you know, in the recent past, I uh, experienced a very similar thing uh, personally. So, uh, and it also ended, ended in in uh, in, uh, in disaster too. So yeah, for sure. Oh, okay, you, you murdered a bunch of people. No, I didn't murder anyone, <laughs> but it was the same you know thing of like someone really stroking your ego and making you feel good about yourself, and then you know horrible stuff. Oh happened. yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I can't say anyone ever anything ever horrible ever happened for, for me, but you know. You know, all the time I'll go to a show and someone will be like, dude, I remember nicest or whatever. And I'm like, oh, yeah, feels good. Yeah. yeah. But let's go murder that. some people. Yeah, let's go kill. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. so Gabby, be a goth, is with uh, this older guy, Albin, you know, and, um, and that they're a couple and they move into the life of, uh, of James and M. And that's sort of when things start taking off with this film because they talk about going um, out leaving leaving the campus and going out even though they've been directed not to do that so they had to secure transportation into the actual city itself because they want to sunbathe and barbecue and things like that yeah and other things <laughs> you know, dude that <laughs> was like um yeah so so really you know the scenes mia goth is like man i had like haunting in this movie man and dangerous very you know yeah she's like the uh the tentress the Svengali, the devil on on james's shoulder basically she's uh she shows her hand almost immediately L that she literally is. yeah 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 she <laughs> literally sneaks up behind james and jerks him off while he's Dude, taking a piss it's like the sketchiest scene in a movie and it was so it, it at first it was like really out of place and you know, i was like whoa you know like this is like i was laughing actually in the movie because it's i found that funny you know and and uh but the scenes with oh. the built the build up of him like he there's everyone's sunbathing you know everyone had this big meal they're out everyone's relaxed you know he's like looking at her and she's looking back at him and on this like it's just such a heavy scene, man. It was just very like you're like, yeah, this is like there's something going to happen between the two of them, and you know, 
Oh course. yeah, sure he, he, yeah, and yeah, James, James isn't expecting it at that moment either, which is a uh, which makes it even that much more unsettling. And uh, I gotta say, like when when you first lay lay eyes on Mia Goth's character, you are like just the way they chose to make her up in this movie. She looks unsettling. Yeah, like I think they like, shaved her eyebrows. I'm I'm a kind of a sucker for that on women, honestly. But yeah. Um, really? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, she she was very like off putting in this movie. It's a intentionally off putting performance. Did you know that she's British? I did not know. I thought maybe she was doing an accent. I wasn't sure. No, she's actually British. Okay. All right. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And she really plays up her Britishness in this. Like, you know, there's a lot of scenes where she's like talking, James. Like, she just sort of sounds like an old British hag. Yeah, totally. And also the age, uh, the age difference uh, between like her and, and Skarsgård and her and Albin was also like kind of like, I don't know. It's for me personally, that resonated a little bit, you know, just like some temptress from, from hell, just <laughs> showing up in your life and t- turning everything upside down, you know? Oh, totally, totally. They're like the couple, like, in, like you meet on like a vacation like that in a resort, and that guy's just like this shitty middle aged swinger banging like someone yeah. like thirty <laughs> years younger than him. Yep. You know, he wants. He's giving you that look at the buffet. He wants to party with you and your wife. And that's that's what mad I thought. Sketchy, this real, was going. real sketchy, real sketchy scenes, man. Yeah. With that guy. Those people so exist <laughs> in real life. I'm, I'm probably gonna. Age, I'm probably gonna age into one of those guys myself. You know. Yeah, I think I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm like a year away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, like, yeah, I'm not, like, they're just like, you know, I mean, I, I know it's a movie, but me personally, I wouldn't fucking, like, uh, those are people you say hi to, maybe you eat, like, lunch or breakfast with, and then you, you, you go about your way. There's just a look to them. Yeah, and, and like, for me, initially, I would probably, like, you know, play it off, but then I'd find myself thinking about it and, then, like, end up, like, just hell, you know, just end up in hell with, with everyone else. You know? Yeah, you're like sitting in your room with your girl or your wife and you're like, so, uh, you know, Alvin really likes you, so it's nice things. <laughs> you know, <laughs> trying to feel out how she's going to react. <laughs> but also, it's about this, too. It's like the fact that, I mean, Cleopatra Coleman is beautiful. You know what I mean? Like, she's an amazing oh, yeah, looking yeah. lady. She seems very grounded, very, you know, solid totally. person. You know, Mia Goth, very beautiful. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, as far as maybe grounded, you know, she's an actress, you know, right there, which is like, but not even like, she's, she's an commercial. actress in in the movie. In yeah, the movie, she's, she's an, an actress. actress, and she's like a commercial actress of like, what's the term they use? The one who, um, oh man, with the term of of the type of character she plays in commercials. Oh yeah, I miss it. She she says she's the one that absolutely cannot live without whatever product. Yes, they're selling, and that was like. The, that that really hit home you know what i mean she has like a very specific thing she cannot live without the product okay and that kind of plays yeah. into what's going on later on in the film yeah and she shows her hand her skills at like manipulation and and acting and and uh, and everything like that it, it's a scene that takes place in a in a chinese restaurant i always loved eating scenes in movies just watching like the actors try not to eat as much as possible yeah no yeah, definitely yeah <laughs> Uh, just a little side note there. Like I noticed, like you know, you, there's like a close up, and everyone's eating like a noodle <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, uh, but a pivotal scene taking place in a Chinese restaurant, much like uh, in Papa Cronenberg's uh, Existence. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. No, I was like, maybe that's a subtle nod. Maybe I'm looking way too into it. Either way. Um, so back to the. Beach. So yeah, James gets. Yeah. yeah. Gets, uh, well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, you take it, Mike. <laughs> yeah. So everyone's drinking and eating, you know, maybe a little too much. Uh, James gets jerked off by, uh, by Mia Goth. <laughs> rather um, graphically, too. Ra- rather graphically. And a very, the scene went on. It, it's like kind of like an extended scene, too, which is like super uncomfortable. Like, you know what I mean? It's very uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they show some Don't jizz. watch this with your parents. <laughs> no, 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 no. They show some jizz, <laughs> yeah. you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. They do. Yeah. So everyone's uh, been partied out, tired, or in the sun, drinking wine, eating, getting jerked off, like all that stuff. Uh, so James is yeah. driving, okay? And he runs over a local guy. 
So that, and this is the beginning, the, this is the descent into hell, which is when the descent into hell starts. Yes. You know, they try to hide yeah. it. You know, like the, um, I, I think it's uh, Mia Goth who says that we can't cop, you know, contact the police because, you know, they'll rape us and kill us and take our money and, you know, whatever, that kind of thing. It's like that sort of right. environment. Like the law is not to be trusted in this environment. Right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. The cops show up anyway. Yeah. So that they, they sneak back on onto the campus. The next day, the cops show up. And uh, this is like when the crux of what is available to you as a rich person in this society it becomes clear. So it turns out <clears throat> that they love killing people. They love they love the death sentence in this in this country. And uh, yeah, so he's sentenced to death. But what's indicated is that for a sum of money he can have a replica of himself made and instead of uh of him getting getting murdered they'll kill the replica of him right and uh it has to be like a family member of the person who's been murdered so the, the son is the guy who gets uh chosen to um to do the mur to kill him to do to, to execute him right right and yeah i i, I love I love the police, like, you know, this is, again, dealing with sci-fi themes and ideas, but done in such a, like, low-rent way. The police station looks like a bombed-out hovel. Yeah. And, you know, the, the cloning device is just this kind of clay-colored pool of, like, muck. And, and not this high-tech tube or, or any wires or anything like that. It's all very just organic and, and, and just made it so much more unsettling. Like they put this thing in, in, in James's mouth, giving him this constant shocked horror, look of horror on his face. Yeah. I found that interesting because I'm like, why that was put there just cause it looked cool. You know what I mean? It's, it's like, yeah. it's not really, you don't understand the, the mechanism of that. You know, it's just like, Oh, this looks cool. So let's do it. And I'm down with that kind of stuff. Me too. Yeah. And you know, you, you would think that the movie would be more about cloning, but that's just sort of like the crux of, of, of to get things going. It's really not about that at all, which was, you know, kind of interesting to me because in a lesser movie, it would kind of really be all about that. But the movie's a little, you know, it doesn't seem quite as interested in, in, in that aspect of it. And, you know, this is something I've thought about. Uh, a lot over over the years, spending a long time on the road <laughs> thinking about and having weird conversations with people. You know, cloning is something that definitely has come up. I mean, you've been on tour. Oh, yeah. You've probably had some, like, fucking really out there conversations. Oh, oh like, no you doubt. Like, way to death. Yeah. When you're driving through, like, Utah or something like that, and it's like, you know, what would you do yeah. if... <laughs> yeah. Well, like, because that was, like, one thing where, like, if you were cloned, would you even know it? You have all the same memories, everything you, you would not know. You could wake up every day and not know that you're, you're a completely different thing than you were yesterday. It's a very interesting uh, idea to me that this movie doesn't really explore. Yeah. I mean, it's not even, it's like you said, it's not about that at all. And it, that maybe there's another film out there that he's going to make, which is going to address it. But I, I would have been interested to explore that, but, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, so many questions come up and it's just kind of like you just have to dismiss a lot of that because of what the film is actually about. You know, and one of the things I thought was really funny was when when um, James's uh, clone awakens and Gab, um, they go in there and M sees the uh, the clone. She's like, oh, my God, it's horrible. <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and it's like literally it looks just like just like him. it's exactly him, you know. <laughs> yeah, and even more horrific. I don't think the clone the clone doesn't know what's happening. He doesn't know it. It thinks it's James. Yeah, and uh, again, the movie would like maybe at first I was like, okay, maybe a big reveal is going to be at the end. The real James is dead. But again, the movie doesn't really even get into that. It's mentioned yes later that like the uh, you know that uh, but but the scene itself where we see the James's clone tied up being slowly approached by someone with a knife who's begging his wife for help because oh man it it, it it sent a chill down my spine yeah the violence is very visceral man which is like kind of you know that's um i see that trend in his films even in possessor like when people get killed they get, oh god yeah they get killed you know what i mean 
Yeah, again, the body horror thing. Like, violence is not taken lightly. Uh, it's it's the ultimate form of destruction, and, it, and, you know, it shouldn't be taken lightly. You know, to go from seeing something like John Wick where hundreds of people are being dispatched and you don't even think about it. Uh, but this, man, everyone that gets killed, is, is it's very unsettling and disturbing. Yeah, I mean, I've never seen anyone get killed, and I don't want to. And I, I imagine it, it seems like very, very much like the, the event of murdering someone is, is like, you know, very, very impactful, you know? Right. Yeah, exactly. And uh, this sort of awakens something in James. You know, they go back to the hotel. The wife's horrified. James is, I'm not sure James knows how he feels. He just knows he feels something. He's awakened his boring, mundane life of, my wife takes care of everything. I'm a failed writer, you know, nothing going on. And now all of a sudden there's this, what is this? Well, this is where I, I, I feel like the film, this is kind of what the movie's about in my, in my opinion, like this. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk about Let's this a little bit. So James is like this lost guy, you know, he, he, you would imagine to become a writer, you love writing and expressing yourself. And then to attempt to do that and fail probably is a huge setback, you know. And then, you know, there are people, there's there's a choice you reach when something like that happens where you can, you know, give up and just accept your fate. Or you can work harder at it with no guarantee that it's going to get better. But the process itself would become satisfying to you. You know, that's what people who are involved in, like, creative stuff, I think that's that's the necessity. Not so much success, but... You have to be, the, the process has to give you fulfillment, you know, and James just seems to be lost with that, you know, like he isn't successful, his wife is is paying for all the bills, you know, and yeah. it's even inferred that his publishing agreement, publishing deal came because she was married to the daughter of the publisher. So right. everything in his life probably seems like really superficial and empty, I imagine. And then, yeah. Yeah. So now, yeah, this because of things being damaged and fucked up in his life, the, he gravitates towards this really dark stuff like murder, cloning, you know, um, not having any kind of uh, uh, retribution for doing horrible things, you know, no consequences to his actions because oh, we can just go out and wild out, and if I have consequences, they'll just. The, the, my clone will, will take the beating for it, you know? Right. Yes, exactly. And, uh, you know, it's almost like when you, like, I was watching The Sopranos when they're talking about killing someone for the first time, how hard it is. And now it's something that, like, at this point, it became second nature for them. And that's interesting. This movie kind of follows uh, that trajectory a little bit. Um, where at first he's very, like, you know, unsure and, maybe a little horrified by what's going on. And then, you know, you know, like maybe 30 minutes more into the movie, like, it's just like, you know, they're just like sort of like laughing about it. Like there's a great scene. Well, we, we should say that like, you know, um, that, uh, the couple, uh, Mia Goth and her swinger husband there, <laughs> uh, they're into this and they were sort of leading James down this path. Yes. And they come there and every year. It seems like they come to that place every year. And then when they go back home, they just are regular people. Like the dude, Albin, is an architect. And, you know, Mia Goth is a uh, an actress, a commercial actress, you know, and that sort of thing. Right. Uh, so they do this. They've fallen in with a whole group of people who do this every year. Like, say, maybe Mia Goth and, and, and Albin were, were like James and M five years ago. And someone did this to them. And now... This is their way of having fun. Um, but you get sort of a montage, like he, James falls in with this group of people. The wife wants to leave. James pretends that he lost his passport. Yes. Because he wants to, he wants to explore this. Yeah. It's, and it's dark fantasies. You know, yeah. Yeah. And you see him go out and acting like horrible. And they, uh, they like break into people's houses. They're fucking, you know, whole, basically doing like a home invasion. Uh, there's some very, like, very 
brave full frontal nudity in this too. I, I want to point that out. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, good for that guy. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, there's this scene where like they're all in like you know like chaos is happening. One one of the people in the group gets shot. They're screaming and yelling, and then it cuts to them in jail and like talking about mundane things like a colonoscopy. Like yeah. This movie has a very, very dark sense of humor running throughout the entire thing. I agree, 100%. And that that's like, I think, that kind of... I'm trying to think Possessor. I don't think Possessor really had a lot of humor in it. But um, I don't think it... it Maybe here, but like, I remember Possessor being a very, very oppressively dark movie. Not that this isn't, but there is an undercurrent of of the humor to it, like scenes like that. And, uh, and, and, you know, just the, the, the cup they put in people's mouths to give them that expression. I think there's like the little, like, it kind of reminds me a little bit of the dark humor and like, you know, an early Polanski movie or something like that. Sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, James is fully indoctrinated into this. I mean, almost like cult for a little while. Like he, he's into it. They're, murdering there's there's there, there's orgies there's uh there's psychedelic drugs um but then you know things sort of take a turn for the worse i think you know like like anything that's new and exciting you go all into it and then you, when you take a step back you're like is is this the right thing is this for me i mean we've all had moments like that in our lives sure absolutely you know and um, there is a moment too, like we, we we talked about earlier, where where one of the one of the group is like, you know, wondering. It's like, you know, are, who's the clone? You know, are we the clones, or do, are the, are the real us get killed? You know, that kind of thing. Where there's, you're not sure. Exactly. He wasn't sure, but the um, Albin's the one who gets shot in the leg. So, That's right. Yeah. So what leads me to believe that no one, everyone, is the original person is that. Later on in the film, after they clone him and whatever, the guy left is still limping with the with the wound. Mm, that's you know I mean? true. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. I, th- I kind of feel like that's why they like that might have been why he got shot is because they want us to say that okay, well, if, the, if there was a clone, he wouldn't have the wound, you know? Right, and it's cool too that like to to do it that way instead of you know uh, making it more obvious. That yeah, yeah, or you know what I mean. It's kind of cool to sneak that in there. See, because I, I mean, I didn't even, I didn't even catch that. Yeah, it was the second time I saw it that I caught it. You know, I, I watched this the week last week. You know, when we talked about doing the episode. yeah. So that's interesting. You brought up like it's really like you really think like Brandon Croner was writing this from a, the point of view of like a frustrated artist because I can see this being like his first script I, i'm not sure when this was written but maybe this is something he wrote a long time ago and dusted off and made now you know who knows the young what the young brandon cronenberg may be frustrated you know he's fucking david cronenberg's son maybe you know people only see him as that i could see that like there's a big shadow. sort of channeling that. that that's a big shadow to, to live under definitely huge huge shadow like yeah. his his father is a you know still a living legend and still making films and regarded as one of the best to ever do it. I think that that's the maybe the initial thing as a frustrated artist, but also just underneath that too is just the the fragile male ego too, you know. Oh sure, yeah, absolutely. And uh, again, this movie isn't like it's not like ambiguous at the end where like you're wondering is it him, is it the clone? Like I said, the movie's just not concerned with that. I sort of like. Again, kind of funny, like just the the mundane ending of it all. <laughs> like they just sort of go through this 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 thing, and it's something so new to him. And at the end, it's just like, oh, time to go home, I guess. But also, what happens too is like he stays there. Yeah, I yes, I wanted to know what you thought about that. All right, I I know I have some thoughts about that too. Okay, yeah. please please share. <clears throat> Now on a you know, there's like personal shit that in my life where I've, you get deep into something and you think it's like more meaningful than it actually is, and then right. 
you realize that the people that you're doing this thing with them, it's just something they, they cast off and they're done with it and they go home, you know? And then you're left there kind of holding the bag and you're just like, and so he's in it. Like he, that, what they were doing, he was like in that. Like that was like his reason for living it turned into after all the damaged personal stuff that he had. You know, like he failed at writing, you know, his marriage is, is basically over, you know, in his mind, the the in the influence of Gabby pulled him completely out of his marriage, you know, and he had yeah. lost interest in M completely, and was obsessed with this like wild you know experience he was having with 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 uh, with Gabby, so that ruined the, that part of his life of being into his wife and having a healthy relationship with her, and he just went into this path of darkness with with Gabby, you know, murder, no consequences. Um, so he's, he couldn't go home. He couldn't go back to the world. He had to stay in that environment. It's almost like, um, like Colonel Kurtz in like apocalypse now or something like that. You know what I mean? He stays in the jungle, you know, along with his, uh, the, the natives and the mountain yards and right. all those people, you know, it's like, and that, that's, that's how I, I see it where he's just like, he, a series of mishaps in his life, um, weakness of character and bad decisions ruined this guy and now he's stuck abandoned by the people who brought them brought him to this place and he can't get out of it and that that's that's my takeaway with the whole movie and i think that's a hundred percent man and there's like this sort of apocalyptic type storm coming yeah yep exactly in the storm you know and it's like and he's sitting out there in the rain with the storm ensuing he's like that i thought that scene was just like really powerful man you know like the fact that he never lost his passport that he could have left right. anytime he wanted. Right. And, and, uh, and it's like, he thought about going home, went to the airport and did not get on the plane. There's a scene of him sitting in the, in at the terminal by himself and the implying the plane had left and he was still in that country. And then it cuts to him sitting in the storm, basically out in this resort by himself, the rain's coming down. Mm. With this like sullen like look on his face. Yeah, how can you go back to your life after after that? Yeah, heavy, heavy, ending. Um, very heavy. Yeah, very, very heavy ending. Heavy movie, and not altogether pleasant. It, it was a, a a tough watch, but final grade. Where are you? Oh, I give this a five, five out of five. I loved it. Cool. A uh, little less for me, four and a half for me. Yeah, that's, um, that's solid. Yeah, you know, yeah, no, it was great. Uh, I just, you know, didn't love it as much as Possessor, which was, you know, a perfect five for me. Uh, still, really interesting movie. Like I said, uh, perfect ending. I think I think he nailed the themes for the movie perfectly. Uh, I like that it didn't sort of go the lesser route and follow all the cloning stuff. Um, I'm sure he could have made that very interesting, but what he made was even more interesting. Yeah, uh, that, that's kind of what I thought it was going to be about too, man. I thought it was going to be, oh, it's going to be about cloning and shared consciousness and this kind of stuff, but it totally wasn't, you know? Yeah, no, not at all. Uh, interestingly enough, I talked to my friend. She just saw this and texted me. That was the worst movie I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, I, I know people that didn't like it either, you know, but I, I, li I like it even more after the second watch through, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah, me too. And what a solid, strong voice Brandon Cronenberg has on film, only film number three. So very, Dude. very bright future ahead for him. Oh, yeah, big time. And, um, yeah, you know, just for me, uh, just the personal resonance of this film too is like that's what I think got me, you know, more than anything of just like, you know, being fucking – led into this dark world by somebody you know what i mean is like very much a f character flaw that i have you know like the right the wrong person can pull me into some really dark shit you know oh man like yeah i i, I when he's sitting there alone at the end i felt like i i get it man yeah 100%. i've been there <laughs> definitely you know? I, I know yeah for sure so yeah very i mean can't really say anything negative about it. I found Mia Goss character to be extremely annoying in some scenes, but well, yeah, uh, that was the point. That, I think. Yeah, exactly. You know, like I, it made me laugh when she's sitting on the hood of a car, 
like just fucking sloppily guzzling wine out of a bottle, like, eating like a bucket of KFC or whatever <laughs> like, chicken that was. <laughs> I know, I know, uh, I know women like that, man. That's the fucked up part about it, I think. You know, in, in my very recent past, I know a woman exactly like that. So that's why. That's oh, why wow. I, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just. Exact. And my, yeah, in my exactly. distance past, distant past I, I do. Hell, I could have even been that guy. You know, yeah, well, that, I mean. Fucking guy, yeah, for in, sure. in my recent past, meaning like last week. Uh, <laughs> like I know <laughs> that's exactly the kind of women that are in my life. Uh, you know what I mean? So that's why I understand this film. So, <laughs> All right. Well, hey, man. Now that I, if you ask me to go on vacation with you, I might think twice. <laughs> yeah. But uh, <laughs> great movie. Um, you know, just also just the, the male fucking damaged male ego and violence, too. You know, just that that whole thing, man, is like something that's like, you know, you, you damage a, a male ego and the violence is what results of that, too. You know, it's very... very right. Funny. And... Yeah, that toxic. That, that's a toxic masculinity is something that pops up in movies all the time now. I think this handled it in a really it, it, like you're not meant to hate James or like make fun of James, but like sort of pity him in in a way. And you know what I mean? He's he's not the bad guy. Uh, you know what I mean? Like he's he's just a flawed person. Yeah, you know, and that's that's a, a very I think accurate way of um of handling toxic masculinity too is because yeah there's like the heavy handedness of like some films or some writing that addresses it in a heavy handed way and there are heavy handed guys out there that are like this guy just sucks like he hates women he probably had you know other abuse in his life too and this is his right. way of you know this is who he is but you know there's there's other subtle things that happen failure frustration um bad decisions depression and if you mm-hmm. push someone further, further, really deep into that realm without getting help, the, a toxic side of them comes out, and that's what this film also addresses. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if this is one, yeah, I'll be revisiting this from time to time, and we'll probably be seeing something new in it every time I watch it. And yeah, yeah, I re- really yeah. liked it. Definitely want to get the Blu-ray for this one too. I think this is definitely worth uh, listen, watching the, you know, features about it and the uh, commentary for sure. Yeah, I'd love to hear a Brandon Cronenberg commentary. Um, I'm sure it, it, it re- like you know it reveals a lot of interesting things. Uh, again, much like his dad, his <laughs> director's commentaries are always some of the more interesting ones I've ever listened to. They don't really rattle on about the technicalities of filmmaking, but more about the ideas of what, what, what was going on into making it, which that to me is infinitely, infinitely more interesting than, you know, lenses and things like that. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, unless you're a, yeah, if you're a filmmaker and you're into film, that's great. But like, you know, idiots like us who don't know how to make films like that's, I want to hear more about the emotional side of things with it, you know? Yeah, totally. I, I'll be picking this up on Blu-ray as well. All right, guys. Thanks again. And uh, this was uh, a lot of fun. We both enjoyed this film immensely. And uh, if you guys haven't seen it, uh, you know, sorry for sorry for spoiling it, but uh, definitely still go out and see it. And if you have, let us know what you think. Maybe leave us a voicemail on our voice messaging yeah. system uh, about what your thoughts on this film were, and if uh, they vary, you know, and I, I would be happy to review that stuff with you guys, and you know, maybe discuss it further. So there you go. Absolutely. Take care, man. Everyone have a good week. Take care, guys.